Good evening. It certainly is a privilege and honor to be able to speak with you tonight. Uh, if I appear a little nervous, uh, you'll have to excuse me. As someone who has six sisters, whenever I'm in a room full of wom women, I'm sure it's just a matter of time before someone starts teasing me. <laughs> before I begin, I'd like to recognize my wife and partner, Sybil, who's here with me tonight. Sybil has worked tirelessly to make this campaign a success, gathering signatures, organizing volunteers, helping me make hard decisions, and generally being a bigger advocate for me than I deserve. I couldn't do this without her. Before I decided to get into the U.S. Senate race, I talked to a former statewide candidate who pulled me aside and told me, the individuals who have the biggest impact on your race won't be the people you pay they'll be the people who are passionate. His comment reminded me of what Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens could change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. As I look at this room filled with hundreds of committed, passionate Kansans, I know gr this group has the abilities, talent, experience, and strength to change the direction of our state. I am the proud product of a single parent family raised by a mother who sacrificed for the benefit of her children. From an early age, I saw her taking on many roles, disciplinarian, nurse, friend, teacher, provider, cheerleader, and occasional dating advisor. She did everything. Without her influence, I would not be the man I am today. Many of you in this room may mirror her, and as I reflect upon her drive and determination, I know that you will all achieve whatever you collectively commit to accomplish. You are all here today because of a shared belief that our state is headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> Public education is being sacrificed in the name of flawed economic theory. Our state court system is under attack from the far right, believing that politicians and not pragmatists should decide who sits in judgment over the rest of us. And our Secretary of State, the keeper of our elections, is fighting a phony war against non-existent voter fraud in an effort to disenfranchise legitimate voters. For Kansans all across the political spectrum who remember a state where common sense, a shared sense of purpose, and cooperation used to trump ideology, this sharp, unyielding term is alarming. The catalyst that brought you all together, a belief that extremism has replaced common sense, is also the fundamental basis for my campaign. I genuinely believe that if we allow extreme partisanship to prevail and fail to tackle our hard issues from health care and higher education affordability to immigration reform to investing in at-risk kids, our status in the world, our standard of living, and the very existence of the middle class in America is at risk. Because of that, three months ago, I made the decision to enter the United States Senate race as an independent. While running as an independent has its challenges, I genuinely believe the only way we can get Congress back working again is to cast off partisan labels and preconceived notions and focus solely on problem solving. I believe we need to reject the notion that there are only two solutions to every problem. We need to reject the notion that for America to win, one party must fail. We need to reject the zero-sum politics of today and return to a time when leadership trumped ideology. A a time where people like Bob Dole and Hubert Humphrey got things done. A time where, leaner, uh, where leaders like Lana Olin, Joan Wagner, Steve Morris, Rochelle Chronister, and Laura Kelly were leading our policy making and were able to set their party differences aside and work arm in arm for a better Kansas. A time where you were defined by your words and your deeds, not a party label. In this partisan environment, I also understand it's difficult to figure out what to think about an independent. 
As a, as a result, we try to label independents with the words that we use to label extreme partisans. It's not surprising that some Democrats are suggesting I might be a Tea Party conservative while my Republican opponent is calling me a liberal masquerading as an independent. <laughs> when our world seems to be divided into R's and D's, everything seems to take on a distinct shade of red or blue. In reality, I'm fiscally responsible and socially tolerant. Most importantly, I'm a pragmatic problem solver who believes that we can only find solutions to our problems by working together. As an independent, I want to be a catalyst for that kind of problem solving. I want to go to Washington to cast off the false choices that extremists have presented us with. I believe we can have a good economy and a good environment. I believe we can have secure borders and a humane immigration policy. I believe we can have high quality and affordable health care. I believe we can take care of our most vulnerable citizens while promoting pathways to work. I believe we will only see our economy grow if we invest in public education and infrastructure and make our communities places where people want to live and work. And I believe that putting our Medicare dollars in the hands of a governor who's raided our transportation trust fund to pay for tax cuts is the epitome of irresponsibility. My experience tells me we can achieve all this, but only if we work side by side, reject labels, and recognize that we are in this together. My beliefs are not the product of a political calculation, but rather stem from a lifetime of experiences and observations, and my true desire to see Washington working again for every Kansan, for every American, regardless of their party label. I grew up the second oldest child in a single parent family with six kids. I remember watching my mother struggle every month as she pulled a pile of bills out of her roll top desk and tried to figure out how to make ends meet. We benefited from the free and reduced price lunch program and occasionally received cheese and other milk products from the Department of Agriculture. Although adversity may have been apparent in my childhood, I was fortunate to have the help of dedicated teachers, great public schools, and loving parents. With that help, some hard work, and a little luck, I was able to live my version of the American dream. I graduated from college in 1991 with the help of student loans, the federal work-study program, and scholarships. After college, I worked full-time at a management consulting firm, McKinsey & Company. Ten months into my McKinsey tenure, I started my first company, Environmental Lighting Concepts. ELC designed and installed energy efficient lighting systems for commercial and industrial companies to help them reduce their carbon footprint while saving money. I worked during the day at McKinsey and worked at the night and on the weekends at ELC. After four years of growing that business nationwide, I sold a majority interest to Kansas City Power and Light and agreed to run their unregulated subsidiary. We built that business from roughly $100 million in revenue to almost a billion. After six years of working for a large company, however, I decided it was time to go back out and work with small companies again, the real engine of job growth in our country. Since then, I've helped build or preserve over a dozen companies. My approach to public policy and public service is a combination of what I learned growing up and what I experienced building and turning around businesses. While I do not believe Americans should be artificially propelled up the ladder of success, I also believe that those of us who have climbed the ladder shouldn't pull it up from behind. Running businesses requires a willingness to solve problems, not ignore them. I don't know of a successful company that stayed on top by ignoring competitive challenges. Successful businesses embrace the best ideas wherever they come from. They don't say, well, what, that's a great idea, but I'm not gonna do it because my competitor thought it up. And businesses that are successful over the long haul never discriminate against employees on the basis of any factor, race, gender, gender, religion, or sexual orientation. Doing so is not only offensive, but it ensures that many of your best, most productive employees leaving you to work for your competitors. 
What's true for successful companies is also true for successful countries. Still in the early stages of an unsettling transition to an information-based economy, America has entered into a new era of global competition. Our nation's single biggest competitive advantage is the number of highly educated, highly skilled women in our workforce, and yet we're squandering that advantage. In fact, the workforce participation rate of women in America exceeds the rates in almost every other industrialized country. Women get more college degrees at every level, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral, than men. Sheryl Sandberg, the chief operating officer of Facebook, included a passage in her book, Lean In, describing the challenges for women working today. She wrote, imagine that a career is like a marathon, a long, grueling, and ultimately rewarding endeavor. Now imagine that both men and women arrive at the starting line equally fit and trained. The gun goes off, the men run, and women run side by side. The male marathoners are routinely cheered on, looking strong, on your way. But the female runners hear a different message. You know, you don't have to do this. Or, good start, but you pro probably won't want to finish. In this otherwise modern world, many of our best and brightest women are subtly, and in some cases not so subtly, still being told that they don't belong. They're being told that America doesn't truly value their contribution. I've seen this firsthand in the careers of many women close to me. My sister Lisa, who's advocated for safer streets and more sustainable transportation options in New York City, routinely gets referred to in the press with labels that would never be affixed to a dedicated man. While she shrugs it off and moves on, demonstrating the persistence she clearly learned from my mother, I can't help but think that each shot takes away a piece of her resolve to make her community a better place. I also witnessed my wife, Sybil, plan lessons for her classroom, organize school fundraisers, put on pep assemblies, sponsor school dances, and lead many other school functions. Yet she experienced the same prejudice in her work as a teacher. Sybil, who's run more than 100 competitive athletic races in her life, apparently wasn't competent to be the school sponsor of a 5K race unless a male colleague co-sponsored it with her. <laughs> All the potential male colleagues were confused at the principal's demand because they knew that Sybil could do it on her own. These criticisms permeate our culture and are ultimately deflating and demoralizing for women and even worse for our country. As we marginalize any American who is willing to work, we impair our economic capacity as a country. With women, this impact is unfortunately immeasurable. In order to truly value women, we need public policies that make it possible for women to participate in the American dream on an equal basis to men. While our Declaration of Independence while our Declaration of Independence, a static document, said all men are created equal, our public policy needs to evolve and treat men and women equally. If you will join with other Kansas voters to send me to Washington in November, here's my commitment to you. I will stand up for the best ideas regardless of where they came from to move our country forward. I will set partisanship aside and focus on problem solving. I will put the interests of Kansans first, not special interests. I will demonstrate the political courage that only public servants can demonstrate. I won't stop working until we have an America where all our sisters, daughters, mothers, nieces live in a country that fully values their contribution to our families, economies, and communities. A country that recognizes one's path in life shouldn't be defined based on their economic status at birth or some other arbitrary trait. A forward-thinking nation where single moms have safe quality programs for their children so they can break the cycle of poverty and build real pathways to work. In America where women can accomplish their goals and dreams without fear and guilt and where men everywhere acknowledge that while women may be able to do it all on their own, they shouldn't have to. If you help. If you help me become the next United States Senator from Kansas, my first term will expire in 2020, 100 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment, 100 years after women fought for and gained the right to vote. 
In that monumental year, I want you to hold me accountable. If I don't walk the talk, hold me accountable. If I'm not an advocate for women everywhere, hold me accountable. If I'm not a true public servant, replace me. Replace me with someone who has the courage to do what's right, even if it isn't popular. If I'm not part of a solution, but a continuation of the problems of the past, vote me out. Mm. I'm gratified by and humbled by your organization's endorsement, and today I'm asking each of you individually for something far greater. I'm asking you to support me through the balance of this campaign, not because of an organization's endorsement, but because your recognition that we share a desire to create a better America and share a vision of what we have to do to get there. I'm asking you for a chance. I'm asking you to stand with me as we embark on this journey together. I'm asking you to do, once again, more than you should have to do in an effort to secure rights and a path to the American dream for all Americans. Thank you all very much for your time tonight and your tireless commitment to making our states and country better places for future generations.